Uh, my name is Gina Brown, and I am the patient education coordinator for those of you who were not here last night. Um, basically, my job is to uh, be responsible for any uh, information that you need as a patient, um, post-op care, pre-op care, um, aftercare, um, education in the form of nutrition, physical fitness. I'm the one that's supposed to get you moving, basically. Um, if you're having trouble with your journey, I also offer one-on-one -on -one counseling. So uh, you would contact your facilitator. She would send your emails to me, get in touch with me. I would call you, send you a questionnaire, find out what you're doing, and we'll chat about it, okay? And we just kind of go where you're at. We try to take whatever your lifestyle is and see if we can tweak it a little bit, get some <coughs> out-of-the-box thinking, and get you back on track again. All righty, well, let's talk about that doing my part thing. We talked a little bit about that last night, right? Dr. Curry did his part, time to do your part, right? Um, and we talked about um, the puzzle. And really, weight management is a big puzzle. Uh, there's several pieces that all have to fit together in order for you to see the full picture. And that's, that's kind of what today is about, is putting all those pieces together. And if you notice, the education and other things that we put together kind of link. How many of you have improving your health um, as one of your goals with the lap band? Yeah? Okay. So if, if health is important to you, then nutrition is going to be important to you. If health is important to you, then also exercise is going to be important to you. And we're going to kind of get into the E word a little bit. If exercise is a harsh word, it's something that you know other people do, let's change that word to physical activity or moving more. If you're at a place where your body doesn't feel good right now, we're going to start with moving more, okay? And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. First of all, what is health? Health is defined as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, not just the absence of disease. So what are the components of good health? Physical is the absence of disease in feeling and performing at one's best. Social health, the ability for a person to develop and maintain satisfying relationships. Emotional health, a state of functioning that promotes emotional growth, not just the absence of psychological issues. Spiritual health, a person's feeling of inner peace and fulfillment does not necessarily have to be religious. And intellectual health, a person's ability to reason and think logically. Weight management means maintaining your weight within a healthy range. Either extreme being overweight or underweight can be unhealthy. Okay? Um, I did some teaching at a local college, and a lot of the issues I dealt with there was uh, people wanting to be too thin, mostly the girls. Big issue with girls. So uh, actually, there's struggles on both sides of the fence, if you know what I mean. What is a healthy weight? When you're really looking at what is a healthy weight, rather than just numbers on the scale, what you really want to look at is what your BMI is, um, your body mass indicator. That actually is a better indication of what your weight really should be. Um, oftentimes, we set goals that our body cannot do. I want to be a certain weight on the scale. But we really want you to look at, from a healthy aspect, what is a healthy weight range. And this diagram over here, if you read that, it'll show you what is considered a healthy weight range. A body weight in relationship to your height that does not increase the risk of developing any weight-related health problems. And as you can see, um, a low risk is a BMI under 25. So a lot of us are, you know, that's quite a struggle. It seems like a long road. But once we start working these steps, including exercise, healthy living, you're going to drop that number down. Okay, there's an indication of what your body might look like at these different BMIs. Why measure by BMI? According to the National Institutes of Health, BMI is an indicator of total body fat, which is related to the risk of disease and death. Body mass index, or BMI, measures your weight and height and is a better way to measure your weight than a scale. A high BMI is an indicator of increased risk of obesity-related diseases. The downside of BMI is that it doesn't indicate where your fat is distributed. Um, 
the body mass indicator is ba basically a height weight chart. Um, but if you're somebody like myself who does a lot of physical activity, it doesn't take into consideration how much of my body is muscle mass. So I, I actually do not fit the standard BMI scale. But for the most part, it, it does still show changes whenever you start to, to engage in exercise. Some people actually should not assess themselves with BMI. Athletes and others who have a muscular build in the elderly as loss of muscle mass may cause uh, calcifications to undetermined body fat. Okay, here we go with that puzzle piece that I told you about. See how the three pieces fit together? Actually, there's a lot more pieces here, but these are the three separate pieces that we're gonna talk about today, which is healthy diet, physical activity, and body uh, behavior modification. What is energy balance and what determines our needs? When we talk about calories in and calories out, we want to kind of discuss what things are affecting that energy balance. Positive energy balance, consume more calories and expend, leads to fat storage and weight gain. Negative energy balance, calorie intake falls short of needs and, and leads to weight loss. Energy needs are different for everyone. Energy needs are comprised of your basal metabolism, thermic eff effect of food, and physical activity. Let me show you a little pie piece here. So if you see on our first picture here, calories in, energy balance, calories out. That means you're not losing weight, but you're not gaining weight either. You're eating uh, an equal amount. Calories in, positive energy balance. You see the guy with the big burger there sitting on the couch? Less calories out, it's going to lead to weight gain. And the girl on the, on the bottom who's running her little heart out, calories in, um, extra energy out, it's going to lead to weight loss. The three components of your energy needs, BMR is your basal metabolic rate. It's your BMR is the number of calories that your body needs just to maintain its everyday function, just to breathe and uh, grow hair and, and everything else that your body just needs. This, the BMR is 50 to 70% of what your calories burn. And this could be you sitting on the couch, okay? and your BMR is, is going to burn 70% of your calories. Now, if we just stick with the 70% of your calories and not moving, you're probably going to stay at energy balance. The other things that affect your energy balance is your physical activity. That's something we can change. So the more physical activity, the more calories you're going to burn. And the third one is thermal effect of feeding. Did you know that when you eat if you eat several small meals, you actually burn more calories than if you were to eat three large meals. So when we talk about strategic snacking, we want you to fit those snacks in in between because we want you to actually eat a little more often but smaller meals. So you actually burn more calories. So the things that we can affect our, our energy needs is physical activity and the amount or the a number of times that we eat throughout the day. Your BMR will increase your energy needs. Minimum energy needed to keep you alive, meet basic needs, that's your BMR. Makes up about 60%, 60 to 75% total energy. Uh, many factors affect BMR. The thermic effect of food affects your energy needs. We just talked about that. Amount of calories expended to digest, absorb, and process food, about 10% of your calorie needs. So when you eat, you burn 10% of your calories through the day. Factors that affect your basal metabolism. There's some things that you can change in your basal metabolism, and some things are just genetic. Um, for example, lean body mass. Can you change your lean body mass? Anybody? Yes. How can we do that? Exercise. Exercise. You get some peanuts. This, this is like a little peanut snack here. Uh, actually, not peanuts at all. Uh, almonds and pepitas and, and cranberries. This is what is considered a serving of nuts. Okay, let me, uh, question here. Is this uh, nutrient dense or energy dense? It's both. It's both. That's right, it's a trick question. <laughs> it's, it's nutrient dense because in a small package it has a lot of nutrients in it, but because it does contain uh, a lot of fat in it, it's also very calorie dense. So it's a two-edged sword. But if we eat it in that small size, it's okay, right? Because it's portion controlled. 
If we eat a bunch of those, then it becomes a problem. Smaller people have a tendency to have a little higher BMR because larger surface area. And genes, we can't change that at all. Ethnicity, um, we can't change that. Stress, can we change that? Yeah, we can work on that. Hormones, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Starvation, this is an interesting one. When you, when you do not take in enough calories, we kind of talked about that last night. When you're not eating enough, you actually lower your BMR. You actually make it harder um, for you to lose weight. Uh, environmental temperature, uh, people who live in colder climates have a higher BMR. Did you know that? Caffeine can also affect it, but only slightly, and drugs also. What factors are likely to affect body weight? Uh, hunger and appetite affect what you eat. This is what we're going to talk about, head hunger versus actual hunger. Anybody here have an issue with head hunger? Yeah? Yeah, it's kind of tough. Okay, let's, let's talk about that. Um, appetite or head hunger is a physiological desire for food. Um, real hunger is an actual physical hunger. It is the need for food. And how you can determine that is usually physical hunger comes on slow, okay? As your body is burning calories, it, 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 it comes on slow, okay? It's not going to be instantaneous. Usually head hunger comes on hard and strong and I got to have it now kind of thing. It's a strong desire for food. If you are eating at regular intervals, you should be taking care of your physical hunger. But usually, the head hunger is triggered by other stimuli. So usually, if you are eating a pretty good banster meal, <laughs> and you know you've just eaten one, then 10 minutes later, you're starving and you want something, is it head hunger or is it physical hunger? Head. It's head hunger, OK? Also, other things can trigger that. Um, if Let's say, for example, you're getting off from work and you were fine until you got into your car, you're driving home. Now, all of a sudden, you're, you're starving. You need to drive through the fast food or whatever. Knowing that you are getting off work and you're now going to be at a more relaxed state can actually trigger that head hunger because you know you're no longer at work. Um, people can trigger hunger. You know, situations can trigger head hunger. Um, we're going to get into some issues about journaling um, that talk about how to identify whether a situation is true hunger or physical hunger, and that's where journaling comes in. What are some of the factors that are likely to affect our body weight? Well, we eat more and more, and increased availability of food service establishments, access to large variety of foods, larger portions encourage people to eat more. We sit more and we move less. Americans eating about 300 calories a day more than in 1985 labor-saving devices at work and home sedentary leisure activities and screen time result in decreased uh, energy. Um, interesting book that I picked up um, called The End of Overeating. When I started reading it, really, really, really made me mad. Um, the food industry since 1980 has learned its lesson from the tobacco company. And basically, what they have done is they've done a lot of research, and they figured out how to tap into the pleasure center of our brain and develop foods that make us overeat them compulsively, compulsively. Um, they found that the combination of sugar, fat, and salt made in a certain way will trigger us to compulsively eat it. They designed it that way, the food industry has. And they have all the experts out making sure that we, not only are we buying their product, but we can't stop buying their product. They visually package it so that we're triggered to eat it all the time. It really made me mad. Um, have you seen a lot of the restaurant commercials out there? Think about the foods that they're advertising out there. Potato skins, right? Uh, fried potato skin, then you put the cheese on it, which is fat, then you put the sour cream on it, which is more fat, and you're going to dip it in a dip, which is more fat, and then lots of salt on top of that. And then those little mini burgers that everybody's selling right now, fat on top of fat on top of salt, right? Sliders, yeah. 
they just, they're basically, they're, they're perpetuating the process of overeating and they're making a lot of money on it. Um, think about when that all started to happen too in the 1980s, um, is, is about the time that America started you know, going out to dinner a little bit more because we became a little more financially stable, right? And, uh, and fast food places were popping up everywhere. So it, it really, and that actually correlates with about the time that America started to get fatter where obesity rates started to climb right about the same time. So it's not coincidental that those things happen. Even in the supermarkets, um, you'll see the foods that are packaged and market, marketed that way. So be very careful. I'm, I'm going to try and show you a video later that talks about diet foods and restaurants and what you think is seemingly healthy, how they still package it to cause you to overeat it. Even the salads. Even the salads. In fact, they did a comparison between, um, I think it was uh, McDonald's Asian chicken salad sandwich, or salad, and the Big Mac, and the salad actually had more fat and calories than the Big Mac did, just with all the extras. And you think you're eating something that's much healthier. Okay. It's called The End of Overeating uh, from David A. Kessler. K-E-S-S-L-E-R. Yes, it's very, very good. Actually, these are the audio tapes. But um, actually, if you've been doing any kind of research in nutrition, this is a real big buzz book right now. Everybody's uh, taking a look at it. it. It'll make you mad. I mean, they, they talk about the research, and even, even the thinner people are having these reactions. But it, what they found is with the thinner people, they they actually found a way to overcome the overeating. They're still overeating, but they're being more active in between. We're going to go ahead and pop through to this one here. OK, changing low volume food to high volume food. This is going to be big with you guys, OK? What we want to do as Bansters is not just to eat the lowest amount of calories, but to eat the right kind of foods in the right amount of calories. And what this slide shows here is that you can have more food and eat less calories if you choose the right kind of foods. Um, let's take a look at the sandwich here. Uh, we have whole wheat bread with two slices, ham, four ounces, American cheese, and the total calories on the sandwich is 476 calories. Now, if we look at the sandwich below, it's on whole wheat bread, two slices, reduce the ham down to two ounces instead of four, um, one ounce of American cheese instead of two, and then we put some vegetables on it. Um, two slices of tomato, some romaine lettuce, and now we have a sandwich that's twice as big and less calories. Do you see that? We added volume to it. Same thing with the soup over here. We changed this very low volume soup, which is actually higher in calorie, calories by adding more vegetables to it. What did we do there? Can anybody tell me what the difference is there? Not only higher volume, but that combination of food. What did we just create there? It's healthier. It's healthier. Also, what is it going to do for a banded person? Ignore the fact that there's bread in that sandwich. But what, what did we do for a banded person by making that combination of the meat and the vegetables? Fiber. Fiber, yes. And what does fiber do for us? It fills us up, right? Fiber is a powerhouse when it comes to weight loss. If you guys are talking weight loss pill, fiber is the answer. Fiber is going to make you feel satisfied for a longer period of time. It's going to fill you up. It has many positive health benefits. It in, um, improves uh, bowel transit time. In other words, it speeds things out. It also takes out excess fatty acids before your body has a chance to absorb them. It helps lower cholesterol. All great stuff, right? But when we think about it as a banster, the reason why we want you to eat that solid protein with a vegetable is those two kinds of foods have a lot of staying power. Um, your, protein, your protein has a long molecular chain, a lot of information all tied together, and your body has to break that apart. Same thing with fiber. We lack an enzyme in our body that can break down fiber. So when we eat that combination of food, that food takes a long time for your body to digest, and it's going to stay in that pouch. It's a little more solid than those slider foods that we were talking about. So it's going to keep you satisfied longer, even as your body's digesting it. 
because it, it just, it's going to go through your system slower. For a banster, you really want to eat the food. You want to eat the food because that's when it get, what, what's going to give you the sensation of fullness. Benefiber is going to give you a health benefit of adding more fiber to your diet. But what, for a uh, banster benefit, we want you to eat the food, okay? It's just like um, fruit juice. Is it, is it better for a banded person to eat a piece of fruit or have a glass of juice? Eat the fruit. Why? Yeah, and it's more solid, right? Okay. And the fruit juice has been blended down, and it's going to go right through us, right? It's not going to stop. It's going to keep going. So we, we want to eat the fruit. That's going to be better and more beneficial for us.